Just keep that thought. You'll be able to continue this conversation uh, shortly. So Paul, um, <laughs> Paul Masmanian is Associate Dean for Assessment and Evaluation Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University just down the road here uh, in the School of Medicine where he's also Director of Evaluation and he is going to provide some insight into what we're calling the value proposition. So Paul, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, everyone, please uh, take a moment if, uh, as a guide through this conversation. Uh, I think it would be helpful if you looked at page 67 and 68. There was something we put together that we thought might serve as a worksheet. Uh, it may have some utility, may not, but uh, if nothing else, I think it'll be helpful uh, for guiding us through the next several minutes. There's a, oh, so I go back. All right, this is me, and this is our presentation for today. Um, I'm not, I don't see a green button for moving this thing forward. Oh, All right, so uh, for this workshop, our glossary of terms defines the value proposition uh, as outcomes plus quality divided by cost. As value-based purchasing takes hold in the U.S. and really in other markets as well, uh, it's likely that those responsible for managing their own CPD and the CPD of others will face pressures to restructure the CPD enterprise to meet the demands of reorganizing health systems. In the face of limited economic resources, increasing computational power, science and technology uh, can present opportunities to restructure large, complex systems in a somewhat brief time, and the continuing professional development that is high value is the CPD that individual learners and investors uh, design it to be. This is um, uh, a figure that builds on uh, the uh, figure that Ron presented earlier, and uh, this one uh, is a slide about um, longitudinal study and transitions. The transitions may take uh, individual learners from novice to expert in medical knowledge, communication, systems-based practice, and other uh, competencies, and they're represented on this uh, lower level. There are different competencies for different professions. My work has been uh, largely focused on uh, medicine, and these are the competencies that uh, uh, drive our undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, and practice. But they also take us from knowledge acquisition to knowledge application, or as more recently seen, from private practice to large-scale employment and emerging concerns about turnover, stress, well-being, and the person to organization fit. For example, we know, and these uh, uh, examples of power distance orientation, psychological safety, and leadership are new tools for me uh, and for many of us who have been involved in continuing professional develop development. They're newer tools that can help us get information about the learners and about the organizations uh, within which they work, as well as the likely fit. So when you're screening applicants who just finished a residency program and you want to know whether they fit in your health system, we have tools that might help us to align those uh, learners or recent graduates with success in your organization. So um, our training of young health professionals is fragmented and often removed from clinical practice. 
Some say we're training health professionals to practice in systems that don't exist. So how do we begin to make sense of what to do as CPD planners and learners? Let's take a look at three models. So um, to evaluate continuing professional development, uh, my sense is that planning is the key to success. This slide outlines evaluation perspective advanced variously by Moore, Miller, and Kirkpatrick. Um, these uh, um, give us an opportunity to look at your personal preferred model. So some may favor Kirkpatrick. Some may favor Miller's Pyramid. Others, and I'm one of them, for the work that I have done so far, Don Moore's Outcomes Framework helps. And um, let's, let's take a look at this uh, and try to see why. So the transitions that we talked about um, take place uh, especially around the, the places where we go from learning to behavior, levels three and levels four, competence, level four to level five. And uh, finally, as we try to measure outcomes at levels six and seven. So let's explore this a little. Um, oh no. <laughs> uh, so when we're looking at level one, we're looking at attendance. I'm gonna skip through these rather quickly because many of you are familiar with it, but also in part because we need to get to the value proposition. So uh, uh, attendance is sort of obvious. You keep attendance as an outcome of your, uh, of your activities. Uh, then we have reaction or satisfaction, the degree to which people are happy to be involved in your program. Uh, then testing knowledge and, uh, oh my, uh, is uh, we have several opportunities, declarative knowledge, uh, um, process, uh, procedural knowledge uh, of late uh, dispositional knowledge, and then competence, the degree to which participants show that um, they're doing what the educational activity was done to uh, produce. And often that's uh, observed under controlled conditions. Performance is the degree to which participants uh, do what the educational activity intended them to do, but in practice. And um, the uh, 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 outcomes of those changes uh, ideally can be identified maybe in patient charts so you can track the process, but also in charts so you can see the outcomes uh, using the, the example of diabetes that's already been brought to the table. You might see more controlled uh, hemoglobin A1Cs. And then finally, uh, the notion that keeps bringing us back to structural change is what's going on in the community and who's got responsibility for those populations. Now we can move forward. So uh, this slide uh, is, uh, uh, tries to address the question of, well, what, what can we expect from continuing professional development? And uh, this is a, a slide that uses uh, uh, a taxonomy developed by the uh, Cochrane Collaboration. This taxonomy itself is now, uh, as of 2015, has undergone some changes uh, uh, in, to include sensitivity for accountability and organizational culture, among other uh, variables. But very quickly, um, educational material is printed material. Conferences are sort of obvious. Uh, outreach visits are trained professionals going to the site to, to encourage change. Local opinion leaders are people who are identified as educationally influential within a, uh, um, a community or within an organization. Patient-mediated interventions are when you train a patient or you give a patient information to bring back to the um, caregiver. Audit and feedback, I think we all know about from performance improvement. Reminders can be electronic or paper, whatever they might be, but they're pretty much effective. Um, in general, we find multifaceted interventions uh, to be uh, preferred. Uh, interprofessional education and interprofessional collaboration 
Now, uh, if we can move to the next slide, we'll take a look at the relative effectiveness of these. So uh, we do have information that's helpful to us about the effectiveness of, of these interventions. However, the effects are inconsistent across interventions, settings, and behaviors. Someone mentioned need earlier. Need is central. We can't expect change to occur if folks don't know why or that they have a need. So interactive learning and opportunities to practice skills is important. The judgments uh, uh, on this uh, column, oh my, uh, uh, enable us to move ahead. The assembled evidence here, the message, the assembled evidence here offers guidance about general principles for CE and CPD, but it provides limited specifics regarding the best ways to support learning and behavior change. For the most part, CPD providers cannot determine the effectiveness of their instructional methods, and health professionals lack a dependable basis for choosing among CPD activities. This is not unique to CPD. There's a growing concern throughout the behavioral sciences that study results too often are not replicable. Um, uh, let's move ahead, please. Uh, and what I, this is to show you, the, the point here is that this is, uh, this is a photo of light uh, and particles taken simultaneously. The kinds of instruments we're talking about using in measuring are really quite crude by comparison. This is a particle and a wave. Let's move ahead. These are just examples of tools, and I think we should skip quickly through them uh, as we're measuring satisfaction, procedural knowledge. Can we keep going, Megan? Thank you very much. Observation lists, uh, checklist. Here, uh, I think we begin to get into a rich data set. So when we, with this information, we can go to uh, an RWJ program on uh, county health rankings and find that uh, we can track hemoglobin A1C or social factors uh, uh, determinants of health right in the community, right into the community. So we can, uh, while we have responsibility for readmission rates, we also have the opportunity to use data um, uh, to make our decisions. Moving, skipping right ahead. These were screenshots to show you. They're all in your slides. This is a reminder that we're working on our tool set, moving ahead. This is a um, sort of a, a standard for people who do continuing professional development. This is pretty much what's in the budget. The line items include registration fees, grants, con uh, exhibits, and other. And uh, the expenses ordinarily include um, BCU, in this case, uh, CME expenses, which involves staff personnel, miscellaneous expenses, catering, audiovisual, speaker expenses, the things we're quite used to, um, to uh, use seeing. Let's go right ahead. Now, if we're making a decision about whether to move ahead with the program, we've heard the word opportunity costs, we've gone through our glossary of terms, and we can see that there are several ways to sort of cut the apple or something to, to take a look at our value proposition and determine what's important and what's high value. In the first case, um, we're, we're looking at a, a, a simple per, um, uh, <laughs> the first calculates a per, phys per physician cost, the second calculates time savings of learners, for example, four hours of physician time, the third anticipates performance outcomes, including revenue from increased efficiency in the delivery of care. So uh, that summarizes uh, where we are. Where, uh, uh, before, I'd like to turn it over to you or get questions and, and try to give you some answers because I, I know I skipped through rather quickly. Okay. So anyone with... Um, Comments, 